So I would like to invite an economist and professor of the University of the State of Rio, Solamis Daim, to coordinate this panel. And this panel, uh, please, Sula, take your seat. And Sula has a postdoc in economy. Uh, at the University of Campinas, she's the author of 33 articles in specialized journals, four books, endless chapters in books uh, when it comes to public economy, social security, and pension plans. In 2009, she was awarded with the medal uh, from Osvaldo Cruz Institute to the relevant um, services to the public health in Brazil. She's the coordinator of the investigation group of the National Council of Development, Scientific and, scientific and uh, Technological Council that treats about uh, political economy, financing, intergovernmental relationships and decentralization. So I'd like to pass her the floor. Who was my orientator and my doctorate? I'm very happy to have her here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Firstly, I'd like to thank the invitation from Ms. Agis and congratulate all the present here representatives of the UNESCO countries and invite to join the panel Dr. João Paulo Perroni, Secretarial Manager of the Intermediate Products Department, Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals, the farm of the National Bank of Economical and Social Bank, BNDES, BNDES in Brazil, economist from UNESP with a master's in political economy from PUC in Sao Paulo. Please be welcome. I would like to invite again Dr. Christophe Ferrat, coordinator of the technical uh, unit of technical equipment of OPS, WHO, doctor in pharmacy for 11 years uh, acting in the health public segment with focus on uh, health technologies. He was the manager responsible for the central uh, repository of medications, vaccines, and medical inputs of the public system of Haiti. Of Haiti. I would like to say just a few words. You can take your seats, please. I would like to just convey a couple of words initially about the thing very quickly in order not to damage the discussion. I think that the dynamics of the financing and investments of the health complex that we will address in this panel number three is extremely extremely relevant for the assessment and access and uh, social uh, economic development, taking health as the focus and center of the social economic development. We can address this financing theme in many different dimensions. The most conventional one is uh, the fiscal expenditures in health. But to that, we can add other strategic dimensions of financing that are specifically uh, important when it comes to the uh, economic and social complex of health. If we think of all the Latin American countries, as well as the UNESCO countries, Brazil, as well as many others, has become a victim in the case of Brazil in the 90s and others previous to that, by prox process of scrapping, so to speak, of the productive segment in Brazil, which is fundamental for the construction of our technological and productive uh, autonomy. So the elements that are being mobilized currently in terms of financing have as their object, objective not only to recreate part of this autonomy, the scientific and technological industrial autonomy, as well as to regulate in a more intensive way the access of population to the utilization of medications. And obviously, that considering that uh, we countries of Latin America have very little relevance in the world, production depend on these initiatives from the regulatory bodies as well as the incentives from the financing strategies and investment strategies, not only the fiscal expenditures, but also credit as well as the taxing system and the 
specific treatments of certain sectors that can emanate from the fiscal policy. If we could, if we wanted just to address this theme from the point of view of the economic development of a country or of the macroeconomy of a country, obviously that as I widen the public offer of medications, the access to medications, providing the population the right of their material citizenship, I would also impact a commercial deficit of our countries. So that that issue has to be linked and be dealt with strategically on behalf of a major and common objective. So it would no longer do. I would like to pass the floor to our speakers. I would like to suggest uh, an alteration in the order of presentations, going from the most general to the more specifically uh, approaches to Brazil. And I would like to then pass the word to Christophe Ferra. I think that I'll uh, be seated because it's more comfortable. And I'll just get the pointer. I will be, I'll keep an eye on the clock, okay? All right, I think that in 15 or 20 minutes I can be done. So I took the liberty of just creating a more general presentation, presenting the integration between the pharmaceutical policies, innovation, and access to health, uh, considering the financing issue as well. Um, let me just get used to the pointer. How do I do this? I've tried it all. What should I do now? Okay, got it. Uh oh, new technology. <laughs> okay, so my presentation is uh, divided in four topics. So the context elements, introducing health in the agenda of development, the challenges for the access to health and the uh, sanitary technologies in, in countries in the Americas. And I consider it to be important to mention with you here that information about the pharmaceutical market in the BRICS countries, including obviously the situation in Brazil. And at the end, I'll have my final considerations. Well, going back to the context, uh, one of the good things in health in the recent years is to see that uh, health has been considered as a vector for a sustainable development and as a model of uh, great themes including included in the agencies by uh, the UN. We also tracked the history of the global objectives made clear through the Millennium Objectives and out of which one of the objectives would be to guarantee access to medications in countries, uh, in developing countries, together with the cooperation of the pharmaceutical industry. Recently, a uh, UN resolution adopted by the uh, General Assembly in New York shows the need for strengthening the national policies in the health systems. And within this package of strengthening the health system, um, is considered in a more specific way the issue of access to sanitary technologies. Um, WHO recently also considered as a priority uh, among greatest strategies for the countries that uh, the countries of the world uh, in order to reform uh, the health sector and implement universal coverage. Uh, you, uh, you will see in English that would be the acronym. So the sanitary issues are very clear so to be uh, reached. As I said, the right 
to access to medications uh, as part of the focus guarantees that a great majority of the medications can be economically accessible as well as culturally acceptable as well for many countries in the world. That is an important uh, consideration. We also need uh, medications that have quality, otherwise it would make no sense to introduce them without having efficiency. So, based on the WHO recommendations, we developed the implementation of national policies focusing the pharmaceutical segment that can include a list of considerations, including the implementation of needed medications, and the incorporation of flexibility of the um, actors, better control over all the production and the provisioning of medications at the national level. and to implement uh, what has been reached by the universal system coverage for the majority of the populations in the world. So we have some great challenges. We can highlight three basic topics, the political challenges. Initially, these are the, this is the fact that the health systems are fragmented uh, in most countries. There's little technology when it comes to industries and pharmaceutical sector. And this is very difficult eh, among the different organs and national managers and governance problems and all regulatory order. And it is necessary for medicines to be considered uh, to be considered as a strategic good for public health and not only as a merchandise uh, and a mercantile aspect and social inequalities that are really, as we could see, eh, in the uh, short video that he showed in the previous section, really in social inequalities among countries in the region and within the same countries, uh, although there is a very great challenge for all the countries. And the mechanisms, in fact, for social protection take a long, uh, very fragile, and uh, take a long time, and in many, in many cases have social costs. I have this graph uh, that I think is very interesting comparing the distribution of world population and the total expenses in terms of health, health expenses. As you can see, in, uh, uh, on the left, there is a distribution per kind of, or kind of income. According to the World Bank classification, which is more or less half of the world population corresponds or lives in a very high income or middle income, and the other half in very low income. Okay. countries. What calls the attention is that when we refer and we make this comparison with the rest of the uh, with the expenditure in health, we may see that over 90% uh, of health expenses um, correspond to high income countries or uh, the average or mid income countries. Half of the world population has 5% or less of the total expenditure in health. This is also um, uh, true for pharmaceutical ports. We see the great disparity between the different regions uh, classified by the WHO, the European region, which is the um, which uh, spends per capita and in the Americas also as a whole. It's uh, more or less at the level of uh, the Middle East and also lower uh, with specifics. And within each region, of course, we have many differences, uh, inequalities, which are very important among countries. As regards pharmaceutical expenses, practically the same thing. We may see that the distribution of pharmaceutical expenditure is inequitable. Uh, they spend more than 75% in rich countries. 
almost 20 percent in middle-income countries, and the rest of the countries, low-income countries, uh, or less developed, they share 5 percent only. The, situ the pharmaceutical situation in the America's countries, just to show you how this is, uh, the, how this is seen in Latin America, according to the criteria, but the world well one most countries in Latin America correspond to these to this category of uh, middle or high income. Just uh, 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 the Indian countries are low income countries and also Haiti, which is in another category. The pharmaceutical products represent 15 and 30 percent of the expenditure in health in, um, in countries of economic transition. And this is a very important value to consider, and 25 to 66 percent in developing countries. And this represents for the low-income people that lives in those countries this uh, uh, higher expenditure in health. It is important to consider that in the last studies at the level at the world level that in 30 countries show that availability of medicines um, doesn't go over 35 percent in the public sectors and in the rest, uh, 63 percent in the private sector. This is this indirectly has the effect that the user has to look for the medicines in the has to buy the medicines from the private sector, which are more expensive, the out of pocket expenses. This is the distribution of the pharmaceutical expenditure, global and public and private, according to the income by category of countries, according to the classification of the World Bank. And we see that taking into consideration the category, we see from the category of countries considered as higher income. To those countries of lower uh, income, we see that the pharmaceutical expenditure, private pharmaceutical expenditure, is higher. And this is a demonstration or this is translated into a, a social exclusion, which is quite important. I am going very fast because I have little time now. I got, uh, within the 110 years uh, uh, that were analyzed by the studies carried out in the Americas, correspond practically 110 years of declaration of, the, of creation of the PAHO. We see that the sit economic situation has improved, yes, if, com if we compare the data from 1900 to 2010. And this economic situation and the income per capita capita has gone up, and also the question of the access to education, primary education, uh, especially in Latin American and Caribbean countries. Uh, this is a very important jump, a very important situation, and we may consider these are very important achievements in terms of improving the life conditions uh, in the countries of the Americas. As we discussed, and uh, it was presented yesterday by the economists here, we see that since uh, 1900 to 2010, uh, the GDP of the, in the countries grew a lot from uh, uh, $2,500 to $15,000 per capita. But however, when we compare uh, this curve, the increment of the GDP with the Gini rate that you see in red on the slide, we can see that the inequality of inequalities are not improving, still persists, although they are increasing or um, diminishing a little. Social exclusion in the, in the Americas is translated into and you can see this, this data, 46% of the population in the continent, excluding the North, northern countries, they don't have social protection in health. And this, is, this means that millions of inhabitants, 275 million inhabitants, over 120 million without access to health services due to economic reasons. The, the countries also have a population Although they are implementing some uh, programs of universal access to um, health, they have a high number of people which are outside these programs. 
on a tardy access to health services. 150 million people lack regular access to water uh, and also birth without uh, birth without uh, um, qualified attendance. There are many efforts being done, of course, uh, endeavors by the countries catalyzed by an international cooperation. Uh, to some extent, um, a lot of things has to be done yet. We have a mechanism for social protection implemented in the countries. Argentina, for example, has some plans to improve um, mother and child health. In Brazil, we have the Bolsa Familia and Health for the Family. In Chile, we have uh, universal access with uh, uh, guarantees for the citizens. Colombia, Families in Action, Haiti. Uh, there are some programs, yes. Uh, supported by international cooperation in the of the situation of mother and child healthy in the area. And also, this is also um, for Mexico, which is developing a funding system for the population, for the poor population. The situation in the Americas is quite, quite complicated of the nature of the different integration blocks, economic integration blocks that exist. We have the uh, NAFTA, the North American Trade Agreement. We have the Mercosur, uh, um, Central America, the Anna Community, CARICOM, uh, and UNASUR, of course, ALBA, uh, which was created recently. Representing to a certain extent a problem for the countries because many of these countries are involved or are uh, or pertain to different areas, geopolitical areas that sometimes have very conflicting interests. This is translated in the implementation of some regional policies. Mercosur, Comics of Central America, the Caribbean, CARICOM, and so on. Uh, pharmaceutical policies of ALBA, which is being uh, prepared, and also the access to medicines group by the UNASUR. Here you have uh, some strategies to improve the perspective or perspective to improve access to um, health technology that goes beyond medicine, also covering medical devices, vaccines, diagnosis, and so on. This is a broader vision representing uh, the technologies for health and the question also of the harmonization of resources, funding. This is crucial for this for in order to ensure and satisfy the needs of the national demand when the programs are growing and creating new expectations in terms of improvement of services and attention to users. It is important to reduce the financial risk, share expenses for users. In this regard, some countries, Brazil is one of them, is implementing Brazil is implementing, as I said, some programs to ensure access, uh, free access, or with payment of medicines. And we will refer to the system, or we will mention in the popular uh, drugstore in the section, in the previous section. And obviously, it is also the responsibility of the government to ensure the efficient use of resources. Mm, which are available for the supply of uh, health technologies. Uh, there are also some other mechanisms, health plans to um, establish uh, um, the, most of the population within the systems of public health and be able to uh, um, be able to permit them to be uh, cared for and receive the attention that they deserve. And also, we have a lot of programs for the promotion for the evaluation of health uh, technology. Technology. This is a cost-effective strategy to improve access and use uh, resources, uh, um, sanitary technology for identifying the programs that are interested to be incorporated in the system, but also for analyzing the products that are obsolete, high cost, 
and that do not represent any added value or interest, uh, theoretical interest, interest for countries or for the programs in health. And of course, there is a strategy which is quite old now on the promotion of rational use of medicines, technologies uh, by um, the consumer and by the state or the organizations. I can also and the government has the responsibility to negotiate within the different spaces, global spaces, and ensure that health is considered as a, a priority topic for the social development and economic of the countries, a commitment so that they may find funding and economic sources to guarantee the implementation of programs, local public programs. Also the production of generics, even important, sometimes forgotten, yes, but this is an important strategy that has been adopted by Brazil and other countries in the region which is a strategy to reduce the cost of products for the use uh, and also to reduce the cost for the state which provides those medicines, generic medicines, and the promotion of local capacity or local ability in research and development, R&D, and technological evolution when, when and if the countries have installed capacity, minimum installed capacity, to ensure innovation oriented towards the needs, the social need. And this is one of the crucial conditions for the implementation and um, achieving the purpose of the uni universal coverage. This is a chart which shows that we have innovation and it has a capacity in the pharmaceutical se sector in the Americas. Very few countries that participated in this uh, survey, 27 from 30, out of 36 countries that replied, five of them really um, said that they had a, a uh, R&D capacity for their uh, assets, which is installed. And it's, this is very limited, in fact. And this is translated into important dependency in terms of imports of raw materials from Asia. And also, we can see that these countries have a production and formulation ability of the imported uh, raw material, which is 70%, and also to create conditions uh, to have the pharmaceutical formulas and release the product into the market. The great flow that we find in this table is in the weakness in the production of uh, pharmaceuticals. I regard the production capacity of vaccines. This is more developed. Countries such as Mexico, Brazil, Cuba, and Venezuela have a production capacity at least to ensure or guarantee the needs of their own national programs. And here you may see more in detail the different the different types of vaccines available. It is interesting also to make some considerations on the priority topics in health, uh, which were agreed by the countries BRICS in different, in different spaces in which they participated and formalized through the declaration, Beijing declaration, the 2010 or 2011, if I remember. And one of the main, one of the main agreements is or was uh, to create conditions and impose new initiatives to facilitate access to medicines and technologies in the health system. And we could also see in the slides that obviously these countries are are in a very complete scene if we compare Brazil to India and China, Russia. The health systems are very different. And the guidelines that they follow are also different. They 
still have great, uh, uh, great things in common, the promotion of the use of evidence, scientific evidence for decision-making processes is also a strategy that they consider important, as well as the strengthening of the regulation frameworks and and there are some partnerships, exchanges, yes, work exchanges among some of the regulating agencies in the big countries and identification of local needs and raw materials in order to fight against neglected diseases, both in the area of development of new medicines and vaccines and diagnosis, and also, which is impacting practically all the countries, to improve prevention and control of non-transmissible um, um, or chronic diseases, diabetes, which has a high cost for health services. Here I have put graphs introducing the percentage of pharmaceutical total expenditures and the percentage of the GDP. We see that Brazil is in uh, in a good average among these five BRIC countries with over 2% of its GDP dedicated to pharmaceutical expenditures, but we know that still it should be much higher. And here we have countries like Russia and also India. The percentage of uh, no, pharmaceutical of total, pharmaceutical expenditures of total health expenditures, you can see here there is a big difference, very significant difference between two countries in Asia, either India and China, that have health systems for their population where they're highly undeveloped compared against Brazil and South Africa that are, that are privileging the access privileging access to universal coverage for their, their population. The total pharmaceutical expenditures per capita, we see Brazil is doing very well in this curve compared against other countries of the BRICS group. China, once again, is lies behind with the to per total per capita expenditures 10 times lower compared against Brazil. Here, you see this slide compare public expenditures and private expenditures. We can see, unfortunately, in a country like Brazil, the, the private market is growing much faster than public expenditure, that the public market, even though they have a growing trend, I think the last year in 2011 or 2012, also it got to $12 billion, but obviously there's a mismatch. Well, in the, between the percentage of the pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical profit, pharmaceutical in the sector and the public sector, there's a big gap between both. This type of curves can be reflected that have a public expenditure which is, is very poor compared against the private expenditures. And the same thing goes for Russia. Because it started in the 90s with 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 zero private uh, public expenditures as the political situation in the country changed or improved. The the, the interest of the the uh, the market, the private market, the private sector was very important, and now we are in the same situation as Brazil does. Some uh, final considerations to be made. I believe that the number of countries with pharmaceutical uh, policies that are being implemented or are being developed is also very important, even though the pharmaceutical expenditure is the second most important expenditure in health in the health sector in the countries. The pharmaceutical policy is a very important tool for countries, for governments, in order to be able to control expenditures public expenditures. Countries are developing uh, regulating capacity, as we saw in the previous panel, 
with international cooperation to ensure the quality, safety, and efficacy of medication and new technologies introduced in the different systems. There are very few countries in any case in the region that we have installed capacity so as to do in research, innovation for new technologies and for products and in active principles even though they have an installed capacity, as we saw in the countries in the region, which is more solid for the production of vaccines, at least for the strategic vaccines, and to be able to respond to the needs of the national vaccination programs. Many countries still have not been able to incorporate access to the national registries, and they have difficulties in terms of the rights of intellectual property and to apply the different uh, patentability criteria. And I believe in order to improve access and move to all, towards universal coverage, definitely countries should assume a strong commitment and review their financing systems. We cannot talk about universal co coverage if there is no financial, solid financial base predefined, pre-established, sustainable, de developing actually reimbursement mechanisms for their users and beneficiaries of the different systems and identify also different strategies to evaluate the cost-benefit ratio in, in also in the incorporation of new technologies to ensure better use of available resources. Here we okay, have a list of comments or points considering the agenda, actually the development agenda until 2015, the last for 10 years. We see the movement towards universal coverage that is promoted by WTHO in one of the branches of uh, of the of the different reform processes of health in the countries i think that this this approach should be used actually as a perspective of multi-sectorial participation according to in order to minimize the judicial actions that are related to access to drugs countries for example like brazil brazil are paying a high a high tax in terms of uh, taking uh, in, because they're taking health to the to court to respond to be able to specific demands in order to resolve actually, actually to to demand actually to sues mechanisms of financial protection should be more mature integration of different processes for, to supply medication, the whole chain, production chain, from the pro production of raw material or active elements to the production of the, of the of drug itself should be better done, better controlled by, the, by officials. The regulating capacity should be strengthened and partnership cooperation among the different agencies should be upheld, pursued, and better developed still. With this final comment, I finished my presentation. I know we are running late. I'm at your disposal to respond to your questions. Thank you very much. Eu queria cumprimentar o Dr. Christophe por sua excelente apresentação e deixar meus comentários para depois da segunda apresentação, Dr. Peroni, e também pedir ao público que, nesse momento, começasse a enviar aqui para a mesa as questões que querem provocar os palestrantes em seguida. Bom, bom dia a todos. É, bom dia, boa tarde. Thank the invitation from Izagi, Unasur, Monica, so that the NDS could be here to share with you a little bit of our, of our uh, behavior, our vision about uh, health complex in Brazil. 
I'd like to share some experiences with you with other Latin American countries and also understand where the support is going to. I will speak a little bit more about the support to investment, to the production plants, innovation in the industrial complex of health in Brazil, whether it be public or private labs. And I think it will have a good perspective about what's going on in the country. Uh, here we have the, the agenda. I'll try to stick to the schedule. I'll speak very quickly about what is BNDS. I don't know if all of you know what it is. I'll speak a little bit about our understanding about health as development. I think it's important to emphasize that Brazil, the public institutions in Brazil do not consider health only as an expenditure, but also as the main development factor in the country. And this vision is included in the development bank, BNDS. Yes, the Brazilian market and the technological opportunities and a little bit of our uh, behavior when it comes to the support to the industrial health complex. Um, BNDES very quickly is a bank for development in Brazil. It was created 61 years ago. So it is a, a nice lady, so to speak. It's a 100% public company. And it's been a key instrument for the implementation of the industrial policy in Brazil since its creation, the creation of the infrastructure in Brazil, as well as the industrial sector in Brazil that has had the support of the bank. And most recently, it's been ever more focused on the increase of productivity to face the um, infrastructure bottlenecks that we have. And also, we stimulate innovation. Here, just an idea about how much we invest. The NDS is quite a big bank. Last year, we had uh, an investment of 156 uh, billion Brazilian reais in 2012, which is very uh, expressive. And this year, it should be uh, get to a similar figure. Just a comparison between BNDES and the World Bank and the uh, Development Bank in China, we can see that PNDS is very relevant among the development banks. Uh, the investment last year was four times bigger than the World Bank. And it's got a strong relevancy in a Brazilian economy. It's still a little bit smaller than the Chinese Development Bank. Bom, entrando um pouco mais aqui no tema da saúde. Okay, going more into the details in the health uh, segment. First thing is uh, something that uh, Mr. Furtado, one of the greatest economists of Brazil, he tries to define what is the economic development process. And I think this uh, quotation is the one that best defines what the Brazilian health policy is trying to implement currently. It defines it as uh, development as something that is a social change process through which we always have a higher number of demands that are met by the change itself and satisfied through a differentiation in the predictive uh, system generated by the introduction of technological innovation, end of quotation. So we can include social change, quality of life, uh, meeting the needs of human beings through innovation, through competitiveness in the industry as well. And the health sector is very privileged so that this uh, almost utopia, uh, this utopic definition of economic development can actually take place because the health sector is one of the few that actually includes four dimensions that are quite relevant. The social uh, dimension in the case of Brazil was SUS, the unique, uh, unique, the only uh, universal uh, health system, uh, economic, because it impacts in a commercial deficit as well as knowledge. Technological, we all know the sector, together with defense, it represents almost 30% of the effort in uh, R&D in the world. And political, when it comes to the social assistance and industrial and technological development. And in Brazil, it's a strategic area of our industrial policies. Here, you probably know this uh, figure 
developed by Carlos Gadelha. And this is what we understand about how complex uh, the industrial complex in the bottom part. We see the pharmaceutical industry and the medical devices industry also, and services for health systems, and the dynamics that is quite interesting for the generation of innovation. Uh, what have we seen recently, and I'll try to convey very quickly, I think you're more familiar with this than me. Uh, basically, we have three transitions in the world, as well as in Brazil. It's a demographic uh, transition. The world population of uh, elderly should uh, surpass the youngsters. And in Brazil, that would be in 2030, actually. So that's a forecast from the UN. A epidemiological transition. I highlighted Brazil here. Countries with low income, average income, and high income as well. Specifically, Brazil is getting closer and closer to the epidemiological profile of the high income countries. Um, so that impacted significantly in external causes of deaths. That basically includes violence and traffic accidents, if I'm not mistaken. Brazil is very uh, representative, unfortunately, that happens in Brazil. But that means that our profile is getting more and more closer. Our people are dying more and more due to complex, non-transmissible um, diseases that do not find treatments in the market. And a third transition is that also is valid for Latin America, which is the an increase in uh, the income in the last 10 years in the poorer populations in Brazil, basically uh, the new middle class or the new C class as we call it. But it also impacts the health systems. Uh, more and more people become aware of their right to health and they become able to start consuming goods and services related to that. And that creates a demand that is very high for the health system. Here we have the data from the Brazilian market trying to unify the pharmaceutical market, the medical device markets, the private and public one. We would reach a growth rate higher than two digits in the last five years in a market that is estimated in 2012 of about 80 billion Brazilian reais when it include both private and public sector and the health complex, the industrial health complex, as we call it. Um, given the scenario, how? Oh, here I will try to focus a little bit more on the pharmaceutical market due to its relevance, but I'll speak also a little bit about the medical devices uh, sector later on. And how is this market at the moment? Here we can see a little bit of what the economists like, the Brazilian market, the pharmaceutical private market, about 50 billion reais, and the structure is basically an oligopoly similar to the world markets that are 10 biggest mar uh, companies in, in the world, represent 40% of the market in the world, and here about 60%. Currently, Brazil is the seventh in the ranking of the producers in the world. But the important thing is that there has been a change in what were the 10 biggest companies and what are the 10 biggest companies in Brazil because in recent years there has been a strengthening of the national capital companies, the Brazilian companies, mainly due to generics. They knew how to take advantage of these market. They capitalized themselves and now the Brazilian companies represent 50% of the market the pharmaceutical market in Brazil. But that wouldn't be that relevant if we hadn't been coming in a trajectory that we consider at the NDS very positive of strengthening, intensifying our profile in the Brazilian industry profile. Uh, this is not exactly a timeline, but sort of a timeline of the 10 in recent years. So in 20, in 2003, we had uh, many problems to adequate the 
plans, pharmaceutical plans to the international standards. So on visa, it's quite important at that moment when it established a regulatory standard um, together with the international standards. And the Brazilian companies were able to keep off and take advantage of the generic medications. And in the recent years, we have been receiving more and more innovation uh, products, projects with new formulations, new associations of medications, even though still very incipient, but with a greater volume. But we do believe that the uh, pharmaceutical industry in Brazil is ready for a bigger jump, whether it be in the opportunity about the new biologicals or the biosimilars or or in innovations closer to radicality of chemical synthesis, which creates a possibility for strengthening the chain of research in Brazil with suppliers of preclinical services and clinical services as well in Brazil. So more important than the gain of the market share of Brazilian companies is this positive trajectory that we see and believe to be part of. Uh, among the opportunities that we have forecast, it's not the only one, but it's the most important one, is that the BNDS and the other Brazilian governmental bodies have made an effort towards to concentrating their efforts is the opportunity of biotechnology. Why? I think you know it. You know a little bit about what's on this line here. The greatest opportunity of all developing countries researching is this inspiration patent process more. Almost $50 billion of patents that will be expired in the coming years of the main biological medications in the countries have aggressive strategies to do something when it comes to this new technology. And then we see Korea being able to have its first biosimilar registry in Europe. China and India that produce already biologicals but not in accordance with the regulatory standard accepted in Europe or in countries with a more strict regulations. We have a great opportunity for, for, for these companies in Brazil to jump when it comes to competitiveness. They have added value of products and they have a stronger impact in the health system, universal health system in Brazil, considering they are very expensive uh, medications such as for cancer, diabetes, and arthritis. So this figure is wrong here, but it represents 4 5% in terms of units and 30 35% in terms of value of all the health ministry expenditures in Brazil currently uh, to treat a very small number of people. So that might be the policy that exemplifies the best the definition of Celso Furtado. Try to see an increase in quality of life, try to find meeting, try, try to meet the needs of the population, generating, adding value to the economy. And about this specifically, there's a number of initiatives in Brazil. Some industrial plans are being built, whether national or international or multinational, both BNDS as well as FINEP, which is the other fostering Brazilian agency that have also, has also been involved in financing these initiatives. And we also have a number of other companies, whether public or private, or labs, or uh, science and technology institutes uh, try to acquire competency and capability to create a uh, positive environment for biotechnology in the country. So, this is a dynamic movement and uh, we've been making huge efforts with uh, the public policymakers. In terms of what BNDS does, it's important to highlight that BNDS is part of an institutional framework in Brazil that's already mature. Our system and visa do so 
uh, spoke before me and the evolution of NVISA is impressive. I think that NPI has had an important participation in terms of intellectual property and companies, as I said, uh, have been on a positive pathway in terms of accumulating competencies. And we have our unified health system with a series of policies and optimizing the purchasing power of the state to leverage these investments, whether around biotech or uh, chemical synthesis or medical devices. And the funders basically are BNDS and FINAP coordinating the entire system. So we believe that the industrial policy that's been highlighted around these actors is or has been uh, well coordinated for uh, to, lead, uh, to lead to this development in Brazil over the past few years. Specifically speaking about BNDS's support, I don't know if you're all aware, but BNDS basically operates in all of the stages related to the possible growth of a company. So ranging from uh, seed money, funds, to venture capital, but not uh, venture capital for additional funds, but a more patient venture capital, as we used to say, uh, to uh, the more traditional lines of funds and uh, the uh, participation of BNTS in these institutions. Uh, additionally, we have a fund for uh, non-reimbursable funds for projects involving partnerships between universities and technology institutes. So it's a very extensive group of instruments to support and to leverage the growth of companies in the country. A few results, our activities in the health sector began in 2004 with the creation of a program called BNDS Pro Pharma. It's actually a pro health complex. And since 2004, our portfolio of investments has revolved around pre-approved applications, and uh, here you see the breakdown between reimbursable uh, funds and uh, the grants, and here you have a breakdown by segment for pharmaceutical and pharmachemical and biotech. And this scenario should be changing in the near future. We have more than uh, 120 operations commissioned since 2004. The support given by BNDES to companies, and uh, there is no distinction made between uh, national or international companies. As I was saying before, uh, BNDS, in addition to having a good past history, uh, we are also proud to have participated in the history of other companies since we have a program that was created in 2004 and that will last at least up until 2017. And Proforma was able to adapt itself to the evolution of this Brazilian industry. The third phase of the program that started in 2013 was postponed until 2017. And why is it a program? Well, BNDS has several lines of financing, and the fact that you have a program at BNDS means that we consider it as a priority and we create a specific line for it uh, with uh, different uh, budgets and so forth. And uh, this is the reason behind a program, and Pro Pharma is part of that. The main goals of it are listed here. The 
construction of uh, an R&D chain in biotech and the fact that biotech is considered a priority does not mean that we do not support other sectors and the last goal that clearly shows our our connection to other institutions and more specifically with the Ministry of Health. All of BNDS's initiatives try uh, to achieve this intersection between uh, the health policies and health needs. Our funds should at least uh, meet uh, the needs of the Brazilian population in terms of health. So to wrap up, I think that this summarizes our biggest goal, which is try uh, to strengthen the production capacity of private and public companies. And we also try to expand uh, the access given to the population to these products. And for that, we consider uh, four fundamental priorities for Brazil, expanding the competitiveness of the industry to uh, solidify the R&D chain in Brazil. We shouldn't continue to focus on importing everything or performing research outside of Brazil. If we are to add value, uh, we should do this locally. Uh, we should also try and catch up in whatever is possible. Biotechnology is an example. And we should diversify the offer of assets and services in Brazil, and more specifically those related to public health. Before I finish, in addition to these actions that I listed here, we have a joint program with FINAP called Innovate Health for Medical Devices. And we are right now assessing the business plans of Brazilian and foreign companies that intend to bring innovation to Brazil in terms of medical devices, so we'll able, be able to have a good uh, history in terms of medical devices in order to diversify the offer of assets and services not only in the pharmaceutical industry, but in the entire uh, health sector. Thank you. Eu queria dizer muito obrigado, doutor Peroni, por sua excelente apresentação. Thank you very much, Dr. Peron, for your excellent presentation. Well, both presentations have spoken about some strategic problems for the UNICER countries. The first presentation um, made it very clear that one of the biggest common denominators of the countries of Latin America and of UNICER uh, versus the developed countries is heterogeneity and fragmentation and the insufficiency or the um, lower expenditures on health when compared with international standards. And this, unfortunately, is a common denominator. And when it comes to development, it's also been demonstrated that there are several health services models, some of which are more universal than others. And they combine with lower or greater intensity into models of social protection that are more or less encompassing. And all of these things can either unite us or separate us, because we would surely need to find a strategic common denominator. The presentation revolved heavily around public expenditures, but then it moved towards uh, drugs and access. And then uh, we saw the introduction of uh, the BRICS, and I'd like to hear you elaborate on that. Brazil, from this point of view, is in a more balanced situation. But I would like to bring to the table something that hasn't been touched upon and may not be pertinent, which is the sum financing of the public and universal system of Brazil. 
actually we should take into account that the public system that is supposed to be universal has a participation in health expenditures uh, that's lower than the participation of the private sector. And certainly from this perspective, uh, we see uh, the evidence of the relevance of out-of-pocket expenditures and the fact that we have to deal with it from a more encompassing perspective that takes into account not only the procurement policy of the public sector, but also the uh, general policy for popular access to medicines. Brazil was able to recover the uh, public affection for uh, the public health policy. And f um, for the first time, we listened to a complaint by uh, the new middle class of Brazil uh, claiming for universal health because even though they have a middle class income, they use uh, public education and public transportation and a health system that is extremely deficient. Uh, recently, it was presented to the National Congress an amendment to the Constitution. It was presented by the population and and it was signed by more than two million people claiming for better health policies. And I say that because the data that were presented about the BRICS show that Brazil is more balanced vis-a-vis -vis the other countries, but it could do much more if it's purchasing power, the procurement power of the public sector uh, were higher and if the uh, subfinancing was not so chronical. Concerning the second presentation, I'd like to highlight a case presented here and very well presented at that by the person who spoke about the experience of BNDS. What we have in Brazil is actually a very innovative institutional engineering for the uh, industrial health complex. The presence of the universal health system as uh, the guiding wire of this process or the construction of this new institutional engineering is extremely enriching because it presents elements that range from uh, patent-related aspects and intellectual property-related aspects and involve also uh, the process of R&D, not only what was presented, which is directly uh, done by the industry, but also the uh, researchers and investigators of Brazil. The Secretariat of Health has its own research agenda, which is sanctioned by the National Council of Research of Brazil, and therefore this agenda is reflected in a financing that reflects the priorities of the Ministry of Health in the national research centers. And more recently, uh, we've seen a line of financing by uh, the National Council of Research for uh, the uh, national uh, health uh, surveys because in uh, epidemiology, uh, it usually led, uh, epidemiology usually led the research scenario in Brazil. I'd like to finish uh, my intervention with one thing that drew my attention, which is the uh, long loyalty of several countries in UNICEF and also the countries of Latin America as a whole, the trade blocks and the strategic blocks that are formed uh, around and within Latin America are several. You have UNICEF and you have ALBA and within each country you have bilateral strategic alliances or continental alliances that are also individualized. So from this perspective, in the case of medicines, Brazil made a strategic alliance with India, and that solved the problem of producing retrovirals, and we currently have 200,000, 200 million patients with access to full health care 
as a result of this strategic alliance that allowed us to bring to Brazil the production of these medicines and their offer within the national unified health system. So my question uh, for both speakers is how to deploy these strategic alliances in our specific continent and in the specific region in view of this multiplicity of alliances and interests that we know and uh, exist and were very well explained by the speakers. And with that, I'd like to leave the floor to the audience for questions and then I'll pass the floor to the speakers.